Hello and welcome to another edition of Heart of Healthcare. My name is Dr. Jan Bonifer, and these podcasts are about helping physicians restore balance in their lives so we can co-create a medical system that benefits everyone. A quick reminder that you can find more information about our nonprofit heart-based medicine and the work we do to support healthcare professionals at www.heartbasedmedicine.org. Welcome to the Heart of Healthcare podcast, series one, episode two, Does One Size Fit All? With your host, Professor Dr. Jan Bonifer. Today, we're talking about medical training and asking whether one size fits all. Standardized medicine assumes that everyone is built the same, rather like a car of the production line, and should therefore be diagnosed and repaired in the same way. Is this realistic? And shouldn't medical training address individual differences beyond genetic polymorphisms and transcriptomes? What happens during training that we do not value the emotional intelligence of the patient and neither the physician's own subjective experience? And why is it not as valued as the focus on organ systems? So please allow me to introduce two of my close personal colleagues and advocates for changing the future of healthcare, Professor Kavita Chinayan and Dr. Daniel Dillingberg. Hi, Jan. So great to be here. Thank you so much. Hi, Jan. Hi, Kavita. It's such an honor to be here today and such an important place to transform healthcare. Thank you. Thanks both for being here. Okay, so the first question that we have for today is, what is it that when all the great cultures of the world value intellect and emotional well-being equally, conventional medical training and practice doesn't reflect those values equally? Well, I think this is, this is a um, very important question to ask because that, that is true. There is a huge discrepancy between what we actually value in our own personal lives and what is actually taught to us in medical training. And I think that has to do with this um, focus on objective data. <clears throat> and um, we really tend to value objective data by way of clinical trials. And even within clinical trials, we don't uh, trust uh, a particular kind of data. We only trust randomized control trials and, and so on and so forth. And in that process, we kind of lose subjectivity because um, even within clinical trials, we don't really account for the placebo effect and why some people actually perform better with certain procedures or with medications or, and some people don't with the same kinds of characteristics. And, um, and I think part of the reason for this is that there is such a great variation in subjectivity and objectivity can be narrowed down into boxes. And it's easier to look at populations, including populations of medical professionals, if we looked at ourselves only objectively. And I think that has played really a big part in this whole, you know, in the way that modern medicine has evolved and has come to this point. And I do have to say that a lot of medical schools are now changing and and understanding the need for this emotional and, um, you know, the, the spheres that lie beyond objective data in terms of both um, medical doctor training as well as for patients. But we are still quite behind. Yeah, uh, Kavita, I couldn't agree more. And uh, you're, you're very cautious by saying we're losing subjectivity. Um, I would probably phrase it by saying subjectivity has been drummed out of me during training. I mean, yes. it's really been, you know, it's like, it's not scientific, it's not objective, thou shall yes. not have any subjective experience or emotion, but just stay in the upper five centimeters of your body. I agree completely. And uh, that has been actually uh, an issue that I have also experienced and I have um, also uh, protested about uh, quite a bit. <laughs> Tell us about the protests. <laughs> <laughs> so I think it has been in the way I practice medicine and uh, really getting to, you know, include other spheres of patients uh, rather than just their bodies and their hearts and their organ systems, because I am a cardiologist and to really consider their subjective experience as well. And actually also 
not being afraid to form bonds. You know, and I do think, and a lot of my mentors and colleagues are also like this, even though they may not protest overtly, they do form bonds with their patients and uh, treat them like, you know, human beings, not just organs and organ systems. So I think the best physicians are the ones that do that. Isn't it amazing, Dan, that um, as we're learning about this, I mean, you must have, you've gone down a similar track where where we've been trained in a certain way and you've started to integrate or kind of come down the path of a silent revolution as Kavita is <laughs> um, describing. So quietly integrating sort of other things that are actually important to you. And with that, with, with time kind of deviate from what you've learned in medical school and tell us about what is this for you? Thank you so much, Jan. I agree. I think that there is a big push right now for the objective data, for the scientific data. And that is the exact training that you're talking about in the medical school and beyond. And it really, in my experience, comes from where we are in medicine. And ultimately, you know, we came through, it's like a pendulum is swinging back where thousands of years ago, all we had was observation. And then with the change into the scientific method and ultimately with the germ theory of disease, we start to look at a place where only certain scientists, only certain physicians, only certain people can understand and look in a microscope and understand organisms that others cannot. And then we take this to what what Kavita was saying about kind of the objective data from randomized control studies. And so this becomes the new science. This becomes the new philosophy in which to hold on to. But what we're missing is the pendulum I'm speaking about is ultimately the integration that you just ex expressed that we are evolving into and understanding that there's more to it than just the pure observation and the emotions and just the intellect. And so what we, where we are right now is in the pendulum and we're feeling where we're actually moving back and we're honoring the emotions back in. And I think what Kavita was just sharing is, is really an important place where when you're dealing with a patient, it's the narrative of this patient in the ecosystem in which they live. And so it's, it's not enough to look at diagnosis or treatment without looking at who you're treating. And that's why this is not only such an important topic for where we are right now in our medical training, but it's how we evolve in our medical training. Ah, amazing, thank you. That is such a beautiful, yes, yeah, so important. And I don't know if you remember those moments when you're a resident and, and it just I don't know, drove me nuts when I was a resident that the, the seniors came along and they didn't stick to the rules. I've, I knew I had them down and they just did their thing, you know? <laughs> I was like, you're not sticking to the rules. You know? <laughs> Can you remember that? <laughs> I do, I do. Yeah. And, and, like, and it's interesting. And then everybody's different. All these seniors come in and they all have a different idea. And you're saying like, but you're not standard. This is not the standardized approach. <laughs> right. No, it's, it's very true. And it's interesting because, I mean, I've, again, as a, it, with a background in infectious disease, I'm curious with you. It's like what, sometimes when you're talking about a virus and you get into maybe the microorganism that's behind it, how is that shifting what someone needs to do? You know, so in your mind, maybe on your documentation, it's more than just a viral URI. You can call it whatever kind of virus you think it is. This is a rhinovirus and this is causing, but ultimately it is the translation yeah. of that information to the person and how they're going to deal with it. That is really important. And everything else is maybe your medical legal side or how you're billing or whatever else. But this is a, this is what healing is about. This is the translation of your diagnosis into something that is going to affect another human being in their life. Yeah, so true. For a pediatrician, this is like particularly true when, you know, the same rhinovirus, the same cough or cold or whatever for a baby is such a different illness than for a three-year-old, for a six-year-old, for a 12-year-old. And so mm -hmm. here it's like very obvious. 
And, and But the same is true for every individual. It's not only the different age classes, but actually every individual has a different experience and subjective experience. Maybe this brings us to the second question. You mentioned training, um, Dan, and, and I, I'm wondering, it's like, why do we train young medical professionals to abuse your, their bodies and minds to the point of exhaustion and then normalize this in the workplace? I mean, <laughs> that is such an important question question and it's something to bring up that training goes back so much further than even what you're talking about in a medical establishment i mean ultimately to get into medical school in our culture is actually going all the way back and is is someone that you know maybe even in elementary school or junior high or in high school is actually choosing to study rather than to so like be with their friends or to go that extra, you know, to do something that's emotionally centering for them. So that training is part of the process, even to get into the door into medical school. And I think that, so in some ways we have to really look at what we value within medicine in order to bring someone to become a doctor and I think in somehow, you know, it's like if we were doing a scientific experiment, you look at a confounding variable, you know, like what is the confounding? Well, only if you took only people that are driven and have a tendency either to perfectionism or to pushing themselves beyond what's, what's necessary typically for someone of their age, meaning like a 15 year old or an 18 year old, or now a 22 year old or whatever age you are to kind of, you know, put your studies ahead of your relationships, your connections, what brings you joy, then ultimately you're already building that in. And then once you get there, it's played upon. It's actually, you know, a thought about how much can you do and how you can do this. And I think it's, I think it's part of the whole system. Hmm. I think that, you know, to add to it, there's sort of this idea, you know, by the time we finally graduate, there's a you know, we're still taking a Hippocratic oath of, you know, first do no harm. And when you take a perfectionist or someone that really wants to do well and they're young in their training and they don't want to do any harm, that is a huge responsibility. It's a yeah. huge responsibility on a person. And so that part of that is sort of that it trains you to think of you as superhuman or able to not be a human like who you're dealing with. It actually separates you and disconnects you in some ways. Yeah. Yeah, that, yeah. Is, that is so true. So the training is actually not creating a sense of therapeutic alliance, but a sense of professional objectivity that we're supposed to hold up like almost as a role, almost like a mask where we're hiding our own basic humanness mm -hmm. <laughs> behind this mask of objectivity to, in order to keep a professional distance. Right. And I think that's such an important thing because we do that. We literally put on the white coat. We have our offices and our clinics set up in a certain way where there's a waiting room. And then they walk from there into the place where they're actually seeing the provider and then they are wearing a certain garb and we have certain tools that we use in which to engage and like oh well we touch with our stethoscope and we do these things in that way and what you're doing there is you're disconnecting from the human experience and i think that part of that exists in which to live and not take that on and that's sort of the idea that's trained within you but the reality as we learn in handling this is so many people just want to be heard and witnessed and seen for what they're going through. And so that disconnection is actually not serving our patients. It's trained to think that it's going to serve ourselves, but at some point it's actually leading us to burning out because we're disconnected to the exact thing that brought us into medicine in the first place. So Kavita, why are we celebrating? I mean, you worked a lot on burnout. This is a big theme for you. So what? why are we celebrating this exhaustion and this depletion? You know, as, as Daniel was speaking, I, I couldn't help but keep nodding because it's absolutely true. You know what it is, is that 
medicine in medicine the kinds the culture that we see in medicine is almost always a reflection of the the culture outside of medicine you know in society so all the implicit bias and and all uh, the attitudes that we bring into medicine we bring it from somewhere else and that is you know the broader society and as as daniel was saying you know it is this we have to shift back from medical school take a step back and see you know how do we raise our children and um especially in the us you know to to even get into college to into to get into a good school you basically have to be you know like close to a nobel laureate right you you have to have all of these things accomplished by the time you're 18 and so what are you going to do the rest of your life is my question you know if if you've done everything by 18 right you've created a nonprofit and you have you know superb grades and you've played 10 different sports you can play 10 different instruments and then the and then you have the standardized tests and only then can the kid even hope to get into a good school and it's getting harder and harder and harder every year to even make that you know take that step and so we're training our children in society to be this way and so what we see in medical school is a reflection of that these are kids who have worked really hard all their lives and they have put aside their own self interest and their own you know subjectivity in order to get somewhere and so they come to medical school already primed this way and you know as daniel was saying medical this this whole field of medicine you know who in their right mind wants to be a doctor think about that right you have 20 years of training and it's ridiculous you put your own self interest aside and it's not like you make a whole lot of money in every specialty why would anyone want to do that and yet you know the people who are attracted to medicine are people who are already extremely driven and you know already have the ability to put aside their subjectivity and look at stuff and get stuff done right and then we tap into that and we train people to continue to foster that attitude and so this is not a function just of med school in my opinion i think this is a function of the greater society and what it is that we value as a society you know the success and how we define success and how we define whether our children are on the right path or not i mean who is to say right and um, so this is this is i think a broader problem of society in my in my opinion so the the training of physicians is a bit of it's kind of symptomatic of yes. an underlying um social value system where yes. we're looking at a, a selection bias of high performers that are mm, drivers of gross domestic product absolutely so they will be very brave democrats not in the kind of us party sense but kind of democratic you know well educated democratic people um, yeah. who will who will um do what they're told and vote for what they're told and yeah uh, there is that hmm. yeah, there is that but you know what it is it's also martyrdom you know we are we are very much into this right and we pass that on as work ethic so uh, you know we say that if a doctor is working 18 hours a day that must be a good doctor right we do this to ourselves in this profession and we kind of define how our work ethic should be and the less the less you take care of yourself the better you are as a doctor is the general perception Yeah you know like i see people who are pride themselves on saying i don't even eat lunch i barely get 2 hours of uh, sleep at night i mean like uh, okay do you need an award uh, what is the point of that right and but yet you know you kind of gain your sense of pride from feeling like you are so much in service mode that you are willing to just go into the self effacement 
So I think this is a whole culture of medicine that needs to change. Yeah, I couldn't agree more. Isn't it interesting that there's a, like the, the kind of overcare that we're celebrating that is actually depleting. Mm -hmm. And it, it kind of started out like a wish to give, but it, to me, it seems to kind of move, actually, it changes quality to a kind of taking. We're kind of, we're not actually in a true giving mode. We're kind of in an, in an we're gradually sliding into this taking credit for being self-abusive rather than actually preparing ourselves to really give from our heart. Yes. So, what, yes. so what would we like to see medical training to evolve to, to then later embrace emotional and, and physical well-being in addition to acquiring knowledge? So I, I think, you know, we, first of all, we need to chill as a community, you know, and, and really understand that self-care is an important part of caring for others because, we can't really give what we don't have, right? And and so to really, you know, to have some kind of training of perspective. And, and the other thing I will say is just because, you know, people make it to med school and, and training beyond that doesn't mean everybody is well adjusted emotionally. You know, I, you see, you know, that that's not the case. And that's because, you know, this huge piece of self-development has been left out throughout education, right? In this cultivation of a greater perspective of what the purpose of life is and why are we even here? You know, very few people ask these kinds of questions, right? And then you show up to medical school really intellectual, but lacking so much in so many other ways. So to kind of bring that all together, I think there, there needs to be some emphasis, even to get into medical school, for instance, you know, you must have taken some courses in humanities, you know, psychology or whatever, you know, fundamentally those things that shift your perspective and give you some emotional maturity um, and to understand that that's much more important than the number of hours you're putting in. What a dangerous divide we have seen a few hundred years ago, probably 2000 years ago, somewhere around that, where art and medicine, arts and science were separated at the faculty level, where, where, where that divide occurred. And then there was so much knowledge accruing that it was very difficult to kind of look outside our own silo. So once you're in the scientific silo, it's really difficult to look at the art side. And, this is, this is where on a system level, this has gotten really out of balance. Yeah, yeah. You know, my children are in this college age and I tell them, listen, every, every college age kid should take two courses. One is psychology, the other is quantum physics. Yeah. You know, to really understand that you are actually a speck in the grand scheme of things. Yeah. And the universe doesn't revolve around you. It's, it comes as a shock to a lot of people, actually. <laughs> it does, particularly for when you're trained to be a physician and you need the, the courage to do something. You know? So let's, let's imagine the, the surgeon, you know, you, you have to have guts to take a knife and, you know, stick into another body. Yeah. So it takes a certain inner disposition and also just to have the courage to make decisions that may be wrong and have life-threatening effects. So there is this there is this need to kind of build some kind of confidence on the one hand, but if this isn't really underpinned with a deeper understanding, but it's just based on the number of pages we've read and the number of years we've been serving, um, and probably disregarding you know, the mistakes that we've made in the meantime and just kind of counting the successes and not really looking at the mistakes. Um, this is yeah, this is really important to provide a, a foundation in the training. Um, for us to to learn to be um, a training in humility, I guess. <laughs> mm -hmm. Yes. <laughs> and, and Jan, maturity. I, Jan, I wanted to add something there because when you speak about the surgeon and you speak about 
the egoic nature of this surgeon that has quote unquote, the guts to cut into somebody exactly what Kavita was saying. Imagine if this surgeon had taken psychology and had taken quantum physics and understood his place, he might be a little bit more, you know, a little less cavalier. And also the training of this person, I think what's so, so interesting is the synthesis of, of the way that you kind of brought this conversation. I love it because I realize an aha moment for me was something that happens in training is we get accolades from our patients. Yeah. We get actually a lot of what happens is, and I realize in this moment that that's very similar to me getting really good grades as well. And so you get this emotional, quote unquote, emotional support of like, oh, you're doing a great job. You're being a good person. You're doing well by exactly what we're saying, by you know, the bias of choosing this intellectual lifestyle, this scientific rigor, this choose other people over ourselves, choose not having self-care in order to do a good job. And so kind of coming through, so now not only through the training, but now kind of the surgeon that wants to cut, the reason that they're able to do that with confidence is because they actually probably at that moment see themselves as the center of this person's world. And they are the person that's going to make a difference between life and death mm -hmm. as if all healing is not self-healing. And ultimately what's really going to happen has much more to do with a lot of things than the surgeon in this situation. And so that's where the humility does come in. And it's so important in training and it's so important for us to evolve as a species. And I think that, you know, coming in, I think that one thing that I see that is coming up through me in this conversation is like to cure versus to heal. Yeah. Right. And I think that's a big, you talked about the divide and I was kind of just trying to define it that way, but to cure versus to heal. I think when you're seen for doing good and putting someone above someone else and being able to diagnose and treat and come up with solutions, well then quote unquote, we're curing disease. What Kavita just expressed in sort of wanting us all to evolve into this place of understanding where we are in sort of the cosmos, then it's much different. It's much different. It's a much different ecosystem of who is ready to support somebody and guide them through diagnosis and treatment. Uh, <laughs> thank you. Thank you, Dan. <laughs> Where's this? There's a quote that comes to mind is medicine is the art to entertain the patient while nature cures the disease. <laughs> so, <laughs> so thanks a lot. Wow, time flies when we when we get into conversation and we start to deep dive. Um, we're already already passing our time. So thanks a lot for being on the show this day. And uh, I hope you enjoyed the chat with Professor Kavita Chinayan and Dr. Dan Dinenberg. You can find more information at heartbestmedicine.org. And I deeply appreciate if you could click subscribe on whatever platform you're listening to this podcast on. We hope you can join us for the next podcast in our Heart of Healthcare series, when we'll be asking, should healthcare professionals use their intuition more? If you like this series, you might also enjoy our accompanying book, Dare to Care on Amazon. Join the Heart of Healthcare discussion at heartbasedmedicine.org, where you will find lots more interesting interviews, articles, and training materials. See you there. This has been a Heart Based Medicine production. Thanks for listening.